We've been covering this for a week. The arrest of Rex Hewerman in connection with several of the Gilgo Beach killings has led to questions over the similarities between that case and others, including the one called the Eastbound Strangler. A few years prior to the discovery of that first Gilgo Beach murder victim, four women were found strangled behind a motel that's outside of Atlantic City. Investigators do say all four victims were female sex workers. I do want to talk more about this case here, so let's bring in Dr. Alex Del Carmen, a criminologist and policing expert. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me. Thanks for having me, Josh. Of course. So first off, can you kind of break down what we know about the cases of the Eastbound Strangler? Well, you know, the Eastbound Strangler case uh, fascinated uh, many, many people, uh, particular law enforcement, because of the way that these young women were killed, right? Uh, they were strangled, and they were also lined up uh, facing east, about 60 feet apart from each other. So whoever uh, committed this crime actually did so in a way that he, he or she purposely wanted law enforcement to know that they were disciplined, that they knew what they were doing and that they had done this intentionally. What similarities overall do you see between the Eastbound Strangler and the Gilgo Beach murders? Because I know one similarity involves the fact that the victims, for the most part, appeared to be, according to investigators, sex workers. That's right. And so in addition to the fact that they were sex workers, we see the strangulation, uh, which is the modus operandi uh, of the killer. Uh, both in, in New York as well as in uh, New Jersey. And the other part of this, too, that is also interesting to us in the criminology industry is the fact that the uh, the women were uh, particularly, you know, lined up uh, in a certain way. And so what law enforcement is trying to do now is just trying to pinpoint whether or not the suspect uh, in, the, in, the, in the actual New York murders, in the Gilgo murders, was actually traveling, which is only two hours and about 45 minutes distance between one location and the other. So it's feasible that this person could have gone, um, you know, to the to the eastbound uh, area and uh, in, and be noted for the killings uh, of those particular women. And investigators there in New York, as you kind of mentioned there, have been looking at other cases across the country to see if there are similarities. And in this case, as we mentioned, there's the similarities between the Gilgo Beach and the Eastbound Strangler. Is that fairly normal in an investigation like this to go look at other cases that do have similarities, whether they're close, like Atlantic City would be, or let's say on the other side of the country? That's exactly right. And like I said, you know, Atlantic City uh, from, you know, New York, uh, particularly is about two hours and 30 minutes. And so it's feasible that the killer would have been in both places. Now, in the past, we've seen this with John Wayne Gacy, who you may remember was the serial killer in Chicago uh, that was caught with about 30 plus bodies in his crawl space that he had killed. And uh, one of the things that we wanted to know about him was when he did travel for business related purposes, were there individuals that went missing during those times in those locations? And, you know, ironically enough, we never found out about it because, as you can imagine, back then the technology was rather limited and we didn't have the DNA uh, resources that we have now. But he did draw a sketch of himself um, as a clown with some pine trees in the background and told the profiler from the FBI that if he could figure out where those locations were, then he would find more bodies. And so he was clearly playing with the FBI and and the, and the investigators, but we always go back uh, to figure out whether or not there's a correlation between the presence of these suspects and missing people uh, at the time that they were traveling. When you're talking about cases like Gilgo Beach, the Eastbound Strangler, are there any other cases that to you appear maybe remotely similar that investigators specifically might be looking at? Yeah, you know, with uh, every single case is different, right? But we do know some generalities about serial killers. They're typically incredibly bright. Uh, they're manipulative. Uh, they're detached from society. We saw this in Ted Bundy, uh, who was a third year law student in Seattle, uh, who ended up obviously targeting women of a certain, you know, uh, haircut uh, that had a certain length in their hair that were of a certain age. And we also see that here in this particular uh, case, you know, in New York, where we find that that this individual targeted sex workers, that they were killed in a, in a certain modus operandi, that they were in a particular region, uh, you know, of Big Lord Beach. And so, so clearly what we see here is a pattern that these individuals are purposely looking for a certain type of offender 
based on their obsession to control the situation and control the, the victims. And at this point, it's been one week since the arrest of Rex Hewerman in connection with the Gilgo Beach killings. What is the significance of an arrest like that in such a high profile serial killing case? It's very significant, right? So, I mean, part of it is is the fact that this is a breakthrough that law enforcement has been looking for for over 10 years, Josh. This is not something recent. Uh, imagine having, you know, some people that retired from law enforcement um, during the course of this investigation that must be rejoicing about the fact that they finally ended up finding the individual that they believe is responsible for these murders. And secondly, there's always the part that you hope that you stopped this person from killing other innocent people, right? So from what I hear from law enforcement on the ground, they're telling us that uh, that they had to move very quickly on this individual because they suspected that he was about to kill again. Yeah, I mean, I can only imagine that you'd wanna make that arrest uh, fairly quickly at that point. So do you think that it provides a renewed sense for other cold cases, whether they're high profile ones or maybe lower profile that haven't made you know, the mainstream media and things of that nature. Does it provide a renewed sense of hope when you have somebody this high profile that is arrested? Absolutely. So if you look at, you know, the victims families uh, all over the United States that have cold cases where, you know, their daughters or their sisters or their mothers were killed as a result of somebody strangling them and they never found the individual, the first thing they're gonna wanna know is, was this person traveling in this area? Did this person know, you know, the victim? Uh, did they have any interactions with her? So there is that hope. And then secondly, there's always hope that law enforcement will break through in those other cases as well, whether with the same suspect that we have now in New York or simply somebody else, right? So um, I think that this actually regains a bit of confidence in law enforcement Enforcement and also at the same time in the technology that we are using nowadays that allows us to trace back as it was the case in the Glor Beach uh, to be able to know whether or not there is a DNA match uh, to the individual uh, suspect and the victim. What questions overall do you still have about the Gilgo Beach killings? We know that Rex Hewerman has been charged in connection with three of them, and there is a fourth one that investigators seem fairly certain they are going to charge him with. What other questions do you have at this moment? You know, I mean, I think most of us question, obviously, as to why somebody would do this to innocent people, right? But, but aside from the quote-unquote mystery of knowing why, you know, those of us that study the, the, the issue of uh, serial killing and that are, you know, uh, basically intuitive in, in the investigations, we know that this individual did it for various reasons that we simply cannot explain in a rational manner. But at the same time, I would argue that from an investigative perspective, I would want to know whether or not they have found those trophies that law enforcement is looking for in his various homes. And that's very typical for serial killers. They actually keep something that belongs to the victim to remind themselves uh, of the power that they once had over that victim. It could be that in this case, they don't find those trophies, but, but the fact that they found those uh, cell phones that, they, that he had used and that he had actually called the victim's families, that in itself may actually be the symbolism that we're looking for in the context of trophies. Would you be surprised if Rex Hewerman is charged in any other murders, whether it's any of the other Gilgo Beach killings, the Eastbound Strangler, anything like that? Would that surprise you? Not at all, Josh, and I would argue that uh, that's likely going to happen, right? So we know that he is likely going to be charged with other crimes, and I promise you that investigators all over the country are looking at this intensely, trying to see if they can get that positive DNA match. What I'm really concerned about from the standpoint of having seen many of these cases over the past 25 years is what's going to happen if we do find out that this individual is responsible for not the murder of four people, but the murder of many, many others, right? And as the prosecutor in New York actually said, and said it very well, you know, he knows a lot more of things that he can actually prove in court. So it's a matter of, you know, do you have enough evidence to be able to convict this guy uh, versus do you really know how many people he really killed? And I think the latter may actually be surprising to the public. 
And what's interesting is we did hear uh, briefly from the attorney for his wife who has filed for divorce, who essentially said the family really had no idea that any of this was going on. And it sounds like from what investigators are saying, not just about this case, but other cases, that's actually fairly common where the family, even though they live in the same home there, they're just not aware that something like this could even be going on. As hard as it is to believe that, uh, it is true. And uh, you have to remember that these individuals are incredibly, incredibly bright, very careful in what they do. They live a dual life and they oftentimes, you know, look a certain way. They may be churchgoers. They may be the people that are helping out the elderly cross the street. They may be the folks that, as in the case of John Wayne Gacy, dressed up as a clown and went to cheer kids up uh, at, a, at a hospital, uh, those that were terminally ill. And so cosmetically, they look like the average citizen with a great heart and with compassion towards others. But deep down inside, they're monsters and they are individuals that have absolutely no regards for life and they don't want their families to know who they really are. All right, Dr. Alex Del Carmen, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and help kind of break all of that down and look back at these different cases here. Is there anything else that you want to add before I let you go? Just that I commend law enforcement for what they're doing. And this is a really difficult job, and most of us look at it with the mystery and the question marks that we have about the suspects and about the offenders. But in reality, this is very, very hard for law enforcement to be able to go through it because they cannot afford to make a mistake. If they do make a mistake, they they basically not have, have a guilty person walk the streets, which is inconceivable in this case. And so lots of kudos to them and lots of kudos to the investigators that are following through this. All right, Dr. Alex Del Carmen, thank you again for taking the time to be here. Thanks for having me, Josh.